Hi folks, welcome back to the Cannabis Corner. I'm your host, Kerry Burns. You know, when the Federal Bureau of Prisons decided about their 2011 budget, it, it, it was characteristic of what had happened in the years 30 prior to that, and that had shown an increase of around 5 to 10 percent. Now, when they came out with their 2010 budget of $5.2 billion, they had pretty much uh, gave everybody the impression that they were going to try to hold their costs down year to year to just inflationary levels. In other words, if we saw a 2 or 3% increase in inflation, then the budget itself would only jump probably 2 or 3%. But the 2011 budget went from $5.2 billion up to $5.85 billion, which is about a 10% increase. And so I'm really wondering what inflationary numbers are the government using? Seems like when it tends to favor them, the number is always higher. But yet when they talk to the public and about the things that we have to be in control of, then the numbers are always lower. And this is a perfect example of that. But with the $5.2 billion budget that they had in, tw in 2010, this, this pretty much uh, was a, oh, if you look back from the period of 1980 to, the, to around 2005, this, during just this period here, the, we, all of the prisons saw annual increases of at least 5%, some of them up to 10%, but the average was around 5.6% on the prison population level. And each year, the budget would also go up between 5 and 10%. And of course, they were part of it was new hirings, part of it was uh, uh, administrative fees and retirements and things like that. But overall, we saw a steady increase from a period of about 1980 till 2005. And then from 2005 till today, we've seen incremental increases. It hadn't quite gone to the levels like we'd seen in the past. We started out around $385 million uh, dollars was their annual budget back in 1980. And at that time, we were running 16 federal prisons. And today, we have 114, and these are scattered all over the United States, and we have a budget of 5.85. We've literally tripled the cost of what it used to be to house our inmates from 1980 till today. Yet the budget itself is done way more than triple. It's like quadruple tenfold several times. So there, it looks to me like that the uh, that really is, these aren't actual costs of what it costs to house our prisoners more than it is that people are making money off this like it's a business. And in 1980, when when uh, Ronald Reagan and George W. Bush and Nancy Reagan with the Just Say No program, they really upped the uh, war on drugs. And from the period of 1970 to 1980, the war on drugs was definitely very prevalent, but the Drug Enforcement Agency hadn't really taken the level that they are today. And so around 1980, uh, if you remember Reagan in his famous speech to the Congress when he first got elected and all, they said that they were going to, to increase this war on drugs and, and start this Just Say No program. And in the couple of years that followed that, they passed legislation which made it mandatory for any of the drug drug crimes that, that happened out there. Now, there are, there are a lot of arrests out there that, that don't carry jail time, whether it's a person being on probation or anything like that. But if they were arrested for a drug crime, this was an automatic mandatory sentence. So this helped to fill up this uh, prison complex that, that began in 1980, basically, when we were running 14 prisons and we started this uh, war on drugs and really beefed things up uh, to the levels that they are today. If you look at the drug arrests and particularly the marijuana arrests, because of the entire amount of drug arrests that happened out there from the period of 1980 to 2000, 65% of them were for marijuana possession and less than 25% were for trafficking. So. You know, <clears throat> when you look at those numbers and all, pretty much they were chasing after the potheads, and they see they saw the lucr lucrativity of it because it was easy money. Most of the people that they were catching had money, so they could, they could, if nothing else, they could get them for court costs and fines and maybe uh, you know some type of probation where they paid a fee each month. And you could see the beginnings of a of a business there on many levels, not just the judges and lawyers, but probate, the probation officials, the parole officers. And then when you start looking at the heavier sentences and stuff, the people from trafficking and, and people with larger amounts of possession, growing, stuff like that, then they started to fill these prisons up. And this, is, this was sort of where it kind of went out of, out of hand there. It's, it's almost like that the, that the whole design of the war on drugs basically was to fill up these prisons that the prison industrial complex was building. And that's really what happened. 
We, we all know that cannabis itself is harmless. Statistics prove it. We've never had anybody die from it. And certainly we have drugs out there like alcohol, we have cigarettes, we have prescription drugs that are all legal, all can be obtained very easily, all can be obtained by minors if minors so choose. The, law, the laws and the structure of the taxes and things like that doesn't prevent any of that. Those are all legal and we know for a fact that those take a lot of lives and kill a lot of people. And we know for a fact too that marijuana or cannabis has never killed anyone. So that's really not a good reason to be locking people up. And so when you start to look at uh, the statistics of cannabis and stuff and how really it is very safe, it's just a safe herb is all it is. And one of the side effects of it is that you get high on it, but it doesn't, it's not the type of high that makes you go crazy and do violent crime and all that as, as the law enforcement and, and some of the powers that be would like people to believe. Of course, none of that exists. That's all just been a line of fabrication from the beginning. But when you start to look at all the the amount of arrests that were done for marijuana, particularly possession of marijuana charges and putting people in jail terms for at least a year or more. And then you look at all the revenues that this brought in, in the, in not only in the federal level, now this was state level, county level, your local sheriffs. I mean, this, some of their half to, up to 70% of some of their budgets were based on the amount of projected marijuana arrests that they were gonna make during the next year before they even made them. So they were definitely eyeing out the public and searching out the public that used marijuana and to put them in their target zone because they knew this was easy pickings. And also it's, it satisfied what their budget projections were. And this is where a lot of it began. It, and this carried on into the state level. State level carried, it was carried into the federal level. And they all operate like that. In the federal level itself, we have around 35,000 employees that are that are work, work with the Federal Bureau of Prisons. And by the way, the Bureau of Prisons operates under the Department of Justice. So it's, it's one of the uh, key branches of the government. But they employ about 35,000 people. And if you look through the uh, job list for the Bureau of Prisons and all, I mean, there's a lot of administrative staff there that basically don't do anything. And then we have all of these, uh, these different groups, these committees and stuff that regulate all of the workings on within the prison system. And they are from one end of the spectrum to another. And it's just a way of of revenue sharing, this, this amount of money that they've been bringing in from this prison complex and, and all the people they've been arresting for marijuana, this, is, this all works into that scheme and, and f kind of pads the pockets of these fat cats that are, that are in, in the system itself. And this is wrong. If we took the amount of money that the Bureau of Prisons spent just just to house the drug criminals and all of the of all the arrests and the arrests and the inmate population increases anywhere from about five to seven percent each year. And of that total total population, it's around forty or fifty thousand a year. Of that total, about sixty percent are drug cases. Every one of them. I mean sixty percent. So you can see that the if if we legalize drugs, that, that Bureau of Prisons would really wouldn't need this much money to operate. We wouldn't need that the type of expansion of prisons and stuff that we have right now for the rapists and the murders and the burglars and stuff like that that actually deserve prison time. These victimless crimes like cannabis and and even personal drug use or people you know that decide to use those drug substances over the ones that are legal statistics prove them to be right for doing so even though the law doesn't but statistics show them to be way safer than alcohol cigarettes or the prescription drugs so but we, if we took that particular quotient out of the equation then the the bureau of prisons could operate on about a third of what they do right now and then if you do away with this war on drugs, guess what? We save $25 billion a year by just absolving the Drug Enforcement Agency. And this can be sort of the first step to getting rid of Homeland Security altogether, which is about a $100 billion a year package, leaving defense out of the, out of the, out of the mixture there. So if we took the, uh, the billions of dollars, and it's up around $150 to $200 billion that we spend not only chasing after the potheads, but after we get them in jail, keep them in jail. If we took that money and invested those two or three hundred billion dollars into the hemp industry, we would have a, we would have all of our economic problems solved. We would have a trillion and a half year industry going on in America. We would not be importing any more oil to run any machine in this country. We could produce enough hemp oil and hemp products, hemp fibers, cellulose herds for the products, the seeds for food, fuel, 
the flower tops for medicine, for smoking, and also for the replanting of further hemp crops. All of this could be done on half the amount of land that we grow right now to produce the food in America. And if we could do this, if we could free ourselves and put that trillion and a half dollars back into our economy, within five years, the United States actually would be debt free and be putting money back in the bank, which is what we need to do. For the last hundred years, we've been strangleholded by these bankers and they know about cannabis. They know about hemp and all there. They were part of the problem back in the early thirties when they got it illegal in the first place. It was those cronies and their friends that all stood to gain once they did that. And it's just part of the stranglehold of banking that's been going on since then. And they know about this. They know what would happen if we legalize cannabis, if we legalize the hemp industry. They realize that this is a way that this country could pull out of the job situations in, of the economy in. We'd have a homegrown industry right here in America. We wouldn't have to import jobs overseas. We wouldn't have to bring oil into this country to run all of our cars and trains and buses and planes and everything. All of it could be done right here. Think of the people that would be back at work. Think of how much stronger America would be. But no, we can't do that because people get high on marijuana. And the people who are getting high on marijuana, they aren't criminals. They're people just like me. They're normal citizens, tax-paying, hard-working, constitution-minded, and we just know that what's going on is wrong. It's absolutely so wrong, and we've got to have it stop. The Drug Enforcement Agency is a runaway agency. They, are, they operate on the same level as some of these terrorist groups that we're trying to chase after with Homeland Security. Folks, wake up. We have got to put an absolution to the end of this drug war immediately and take these revenues that we're just throwing away, that we get nothing back for, all the lives that we ruin, everything, put all of that to work and we really could build this country. We've got to get past the powers that be. We've got to mass together. We have to do a collective effort because that's what it's going to take to overthrow these people. And this is what we need to do. We encourage all of you to visit our websites, CannabisCorner.us. Research the videos. We put them out there for you. There's lots of good information. Check out the different sites that you read, come across yourself on the internet and all the different programs and support these groups. We have got to end this prohibition today. It's not only crippling and ruining innocent lives, but it's also crippling this country. And this is something that we are in control of. We can stop that. And we, we all here at the Cannabis Corner urge your support in helping us bring this about. And I thank you for spending time in the Cannabis Corner.